Hello, you are listening to the Divorce University Online Podcast with your hosts, Thomas and Tammy Ferreira. Hi, I'm Tammy. And I'm Thomas. And today we are asking the question, is your ex stealing your happiness? And this particular topic was Thomas's brainchild, so I'm going to let him introduce it. Okay, so I am an avid fan of the Dennis Prager show. Uh, and, uh, for, and he has a segment on his show called the happiness hour. Right. And what his thesis is for the happiness hour is that happy people make the world a better place and miserable people make the world a poor, a A less happy, a less happy, (laughs) a, a better, a worse place. Right. You know, in other words, you know, Saddam Hussein. Unhappy person. Right. Vladimir Putin. Unhappy, unhappy person. person. Yeah. You know, they do th- because Joseph they Joseph Stalin. Yeah. Unhappy person. Right? And you know who else? Your ex. <laughs> My ex-husband. No, know. not your ex particular. But oh, the, a, our exes. The, all of our exes. There you go. Yeah. Right. Hence, don't live in Texas, actually. Right. So the... You know, I'm the one that makes the joke. Okay? Sorry, I'm trying to fill in. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. So, if it, but the idea is that we have an obligation to be happy. Right. Yeah. And if we're happy, we're going to get what I want, what we want. Like when I go to court and I have somebody who's a, basically a happy person, they tend to get a better result. Right. You're more likable when you're happy. Right. And- the court, the court is looking at, you know, should I, should I place the child? Uh, should I give more time to the grump? Right. Who's sitting there, uh, biting their fingernails and, and attacking the other parent. Right. Or should I give the child to the, to the parent who really seems, you know, like they, they have something positive to share with that child. Yeah, it's very interesting because, I mean, I feel like you and I need bullhorns and shouting this from the rooftop. And, you know, I mean, I know we do our podcast and we have our our loyal listeners who we love and appreciate. But it's just it's like so many people don't understand this. Right. You know, everybody you talk to just about it when they at least when they first call, they're of the mindset that they just need the right attorney or they need the right strategy or they need the right piece of evidence. Yeah. If only I took more videotape. <laughs> yeah. Or I said this other thing in my declaration or yeah. I had so-and-so testify or I, you know, they go down the list and honestly, that's not the thing. Right. Most of the time, the thing is your own attitudes and behaviors. And so if your attitudes and behaviors are being born out of a place of happiness, right. you're going to be behaving the way the court wants you to. And if your behaviors are born out of victimhood and resentment, your case is going to bomb. Right, right. And it, it, it all goes back when, when I was first going through my divorce, uh, I was upset because I didn't want the divorce. Right. And it, it's pretty easy to, to feel resentful and 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 blameful but it was like well wait a minute it's nice and quiet in the house well we got that i can listen to whatever music i want to yeah or i can watch whatever tv show i want to that's right right and i can eat what i want for dinner (laughs) and and you know frankly having her around was was in and no no offense to you if you ever listen to this uh uh from my ex-wife but it was a drag having her around right it was right and what I figured out is because I'm, uh, I'm a guy that likes to read. I, I like um, uh, very kind of heavy books, and and I I like books on theological uh, issues and boring and stuff. It was <laughs> <laughs> history, <laughs> politics, religion. I just yeah. take all your top boring <laughs> subjects. That's pretty much what Thomas likes to read. You're on a roll, aren't I, you? I am today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, it was wonderful just to have have time to to do those sort of things. Yeah, uh, and it was also wonderful to dream a little bit, like just drive around and go. All right, I could live in this neighborhood. Yeah, you drive through and and maybe you go to some open houses and and 
Okay, so so I'm going to have a pay cut. So for a while, I was looking at modular houses. There are some really cute neighborhoods in San Diego County that are modular. Uh, and I never bought a modular home. But, you know, hey, I can be trailer trash. Why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> but But just, you know, kind of think, well, okay, this is this is the next chapter in my life. Right. Okay. And I just love being dad. Right. That's that's one of the things. I love being dad and I always loved being dad. Right. Uh and to this day I relish and cherish uh the relationship I have with my two sons who are right. now grown at, grown bleep men. Yeah, they're both 18 right now. They're yeah. both 18. They're 11 months apart, so we're in that little window of the year where they're the same age. So Right. So, you know, for heaven's sake, there are ways, because here's what happens with with all of us, is we get sucked into the drama. Yeah. And we get sucked in. It's like, like this huge sucking sound. Uh, and it's attractive because there's a level on which it feels good to sit and resent. Yeah. You just kind of roll it around in your mouth and, oh, that stupid B-I, you know what. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's making me miserable. And that's exactly what she's doing. She's making me miserable. Right. But here's the thing. You've got this wonderful thing called free will. And free will allows you to to stop letting them suck the life out of you. Right. Right. And so to get back to my story, Dennis Prager had this guy. His name is Stephen Marmer. He's a psycho. He's a psychiatrist, a mental health professional. He specializes in therapy, basically, uh, clinical therapy. And he and he's a. Is, then they say he's a professor at UCLA. He's a professor of medicine at UCLA. Yeah. In the psych. psych professor of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. And he had these five things uh, that if you do these five things, you'll you're guaranteed to increase your happiness. So as soon as I heard that, I enjoy being happy. I don't know about you. Uh, I thought, wow, I, you know, I'm going to listen to this. Yeah. Uh, and I've been thinking, how do these things apply to divorce? So let's 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 take let's just take one of them. Okay. So you know, and I want to add to that. It's mm. like you and I talk about all. I've talked about all five of these things throughout right. the podcast. So these these are all things that you and I have focused on in the past. But I would say, you know, in the beginning, I mean, Thomas and I had the same struggle. I'm not sitting here telling you I didn't have resentment or I didn't enable um, my ex-husband to rob me of my joy. Yeah. But what I am telling you is you want to make that period of your life as short-lived as possible. And because it's almost impossible to come out of a divorce without some negative feelings towards the other person. I mean, yeah. let's face it, we're human and we almost all have that. The key for you is going to be to deal with it, to move through it, and to get to the point to where you are on the other side of it and you can feel happy again. And I can just remember thinking to myself, I just want things to feel normal. Right. You know, I just, and I think that was my code for happy, what I perceived as happiness. You know, I just want things to be normal. Right. And so when Thomas and I first met, we were both about six months in on our separations. And um, we met, and the night of our very first dinner, we've told this story, um, we spent about two hours walking on the beach. It was so romantic. In Carlsbad, California. And the only thing we did for almost that entire two hours was complain about our ex-spouses. Right. Right. So, I mean, we've been there. We've been in the negativity soup, as I like to call it. But our goal is always to help you move through that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And honestly, that negative, negative feeling towards the other person will absolutely destroy you in court as well. It will. Um, I have a, one of my, uh, you know, coaching clients this week who, you know, they've been through this just very nasty custody of Val and the whole thing. And I mean, it, it looks like everything is going to go the way it's a that, child custody evaluation. Yeah. I said that child you said, you said custody valid. I don't know other people. Know oh, what child that custody is, so. evaluation from a, like right. a private, you know, a therapist right. evaluator of some sort. And to see who gets time with the kids. Well, to see and what, what the parenting right. plan should be, who the decision maker should be, 
you know, how do you resolve issues when they, when parents don't agree on decision making, you know, different things like that are what custody evaluators look at. They look at, they will generally um, look at the kids' preferences, especially mm -hmm. if they're teens or they're older, not so much when they're younger, you know, all those types of things. And they do, um, they usually do some form of psychometric testing also to test for, right. you know, different. So, so what, uh, what happened in this case? Personal and personal, um, uh, what was I trying to say? Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Any, any sort of, of mental illness or personal uh you know, struggles as far as like yeah. anxiety, depression, right. whatever. Well, how's your mental health? Right. Yeah. It's to assess yeah. your mental health. And so, um, yeah. it, we don't have, you know, the, they're waiting on the report, the final report, but we believe based on all the indicators that it looks like my client who is mom in this case is, is going to get it pretty much what she asked for. And let me just say, don't get me wrong. Fantastic mom. Okay. Yeah. She's a fantastic mom, very child focused. Uh, has really yeah. not displayed. I'm thinking of trading my mother for her. <laughs> hasn't displayed a lot of anger towards him in mm -hmm. some ways, but also has been working with me to cope with that in a, in a lot of ways and not be reactive and learn how to tone those things down. But as good as she is, what has really handed this victory to her, in my opinion, is how poorly he's behaved. Yes. And I have said this to her on several occasions. I kept saying, when we were, when, when she was like getting ready for the custody of Val and like feeling so nervous and everything, I kept saying like, look, I just don't see any scenario where he performs well in this. I think his anger, his resentment, his victimhood is so bad right. that in some ways it really didn't matter what she said, as long as she didn't go off the deep end and start, <laughs> you know, attacking him or something. Right. Well, the difference is stark because he is extremely negative. And extremely, extremely negative. And not only is he negative, but he's fixated. Uh, uh, his agenda seems to everybody in the room except him to be revenge. Right. Right. Yeah. Everything he does and says seems to be uh, driven right. by his resentment towards her and the revenge that he feels he needs to exact upon her. Right. And it, what's funny is we have a saying in AA. Don't, t t don't, don't ask me you know, how I know about things from AA, but I do. That's another podcast. That's a different pod a podcast for another day. But Thomas that, is not a recovering alcoholic. I'm not we'll an just, alcoholic. We'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but the saying says that you know, harboring resentment in your heart for another person is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Right. And that's exactly what's happened in this case. Right. He's sitting there gnawing on his, he's obsessed with her. Right. Right. And that's coming yeah. through to everybody. It's coming through to the uh, custody, child custody evaluator. It's coming through to the courts. It's coming through to, you know, they've seen, uh, you know, a mediator in the past. Like every single person that comes in contact with him clearly sees this resentment. And right. honestly. Except for him. Except for him. And honestly. If he could deal with that piece of it, yeah, he'd probably win. He'd be doing so. I mean, he'd be doing so much better. You got to yeah. get up early in the morning to beat her as a mom. I think in a lot of ways, but it's kind of like mean, trying to beat me as a dad, right? And we yeah. always talk about how yeah. how in mm. California, you know, the the level is not who's the better parent. The level is adequacy. But in this case, his victimhood is so strong that they're seeing him as not adequate because he doesn't prioritize the children. Right. They feel like all the decision-making is coming through the, the, the uh, view of resentment of mom. And so it's not coming through as concern about the children. And so therefore they're seeing him as not an adequate parent because he's not considering the children in the different parenting plans or decisions he's making or or whatever and that's true of a, a lot of our clients right they're, they're they're sucked into the vortex right uh remember that the person that that you were with that you were married to knows where the knows where the minds are they, right they know how to push your buttons they sure do uh so it's really easy to get sucked back into the vortex as i used to put it of yeah. negativity yeah uh and you want to avoid that because it, it hurts your case uh, because if if both of you are in that negative place, 
uh, and you go into court or you go into FCS or you go to a, a, an evaluation of any kind. Right. Uh, and both of you are in that state. The court kind of shrugs its shoulders and says, well, you know, both of you, both of you are, are doing this. Well, and here's what happens. Yeah. Is one parent, the more stable parent, the more sane parent feels like they're trying to point out the craziness that is right, the ex. Right. But by virtue of pointing out, you make yourself look crazy also. Right, exactly. And that's the problem. You have to step back and let the experts around you figure out this is happening. And when I say experts, I mean the judge, the attorneys, you know, minors counsel, your guardian ad litem, your custody evaluator, your FCS person, whoever it is that you're dealing with, you have to step back enough. It's it's almost like you're overshadowing the other person so much that they can't see the other person for what they really are. But our fear in stepping back is that those experts won't figure it out. Right. And here's how they figure it out. You emphasize the positives about you. Right. And let them attack you and they'll figure it out. That's right. That's so, right. So let's, let's go to our five things. Well, I don't know if the, these are all, I don't know if we're going to get to all five of them, but okay. it's, you know, but I'd like to throw a couple of them out anyway. Okay. And so we'll pick two of his five things. And you know, if you want to, if you want to hear their take on it, which was not divorce related at all, it was just about people in general. Um, you know, then you can look up Dennis Prager, P R A G E R. You have to have and, Prager Tobia to hear the to, to hear the past episodes. Okay. Well, fantastic. Go it's, to Dennis Prager. And it's sign six up bucks. For it's six bucks a month. <laughs> Sign up for Pragertopia. It's almost and, free. No. And you can listen to the, the, it was a fantastic episode. So um, anyway. And we're stealing all their material. <laughs> we're not stealing Sorry. all their material. No, we're not. But no, we're taking a couple things and we're applying them to divorce specifically. Here, here's one of my favorite things that they said. You, there are certain things about your life that are good precisely through no through nothing you did, they just happened to you. What are those things? Make a list. Yeah. What are some things that are really awesome about your life? Here's what I tell my kids. I tell them, boys, and then we, you know, how negative teenagers can be. Yeah. So, you know, we had, we had conflict recently in the house and we have step parent, step families that sometimes don't get along and it, it can be pretty tough. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, my boy, the other day, he was pretty unhinged. Right. Uh, so I said to him, you know, you know, dude, you live in America. And let's think about this. In America, we, we were a wealthy society, probably the wealthiest in history. Right. And we live in Southern California, and we live about like three or four miles from the beach. Right. Uh, and we've got the beach. We've got the nice weather. Right. We've got... Um, you know, there's food on the table. There's groceries. Yeah, there's you got, a in, bed, you got a bed to sleep in every night. I told him if you'd lived 150 years ago, no indoor plumbing. Right. You got to go outside in the snow to use use the outhouse. Yeah. You know, these are things that we didn't control. We didn't control when we were born and when. Uh, we came in where we live and what country we live in. Who we were born to. You know, for heaven's sakes, living in the United States of America is is, is a fantastic thing. You know, as I, as I like to, to state, one of my hobbies lately is following the war in Ukraine. And I remember I saw a picture of these uh, children. I call them children. They were young men, but they were about the age of my boys, you know, 18, 19, with their soft face, you know, with the peach fuzz on their faces in military uniforms, about to be sent to the front. Aren't you glad you're not them? Yeah. Yeah, or aren't you glad it isn't one of your kids? Yeah, or it's not one of your kids. Right. You know, there are things you can be grateful for without even, like, trying to think hard. Right. Uh, and, and those are good things. Right. Uh, so a second thing you can do, like, that's positive is you can emphasize and think about and be grateful for the relationships you have in your life. Right. Instead of being angry about the relationship that broke down, you have a relationship with your kids. Right. Okay. You're their only mom. You're their only dad. Right. And, you know, love on them. 
you know, and be there for them. Right. That's good. It gives you meaning. It gives you it gives you direction. It gives you something to think about besides your ex. Right. So do I get to pick which one was my favorite? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna. No, pick. no, no. I want to do another one. All right. <laughs> Out of the five things. Okay. So here's what I found very interesting. Um, one of the questions that uh, Dennis asked Dr. Marmer on the show. I don't know. Re- yeah. And one of the things that he asked him is he said. Um, do you, uh, or, uh, what, you know, what is your success rate in working with clients? Yeah. What's your batting average? Yeah. What's your batting average? I think is the word he used. And the doctor said probably 75 to 80%. And so the interesting thing about that is he said, here's the linchpin in his opinion, this was like the most pivotal issue. And, and one of his five things was, do you see yourself as a victim Or do you see yourself as responsible for your life? Right. And he said once he can, um, you know, get someone to the point to where they agree that they're responsible for their own life and they're not just a victim, that's when they really start to make a transition. Because if you're this person's victim, then, or if you see everything as your ex's fault, then what happens is, you don't have any control over that, right? Right. If everything is my ex-husband and everything he does and everything he says and every time he takes me to court and every time he whatever. Yeah, and he's nasty to me on talking parents and and uh, he pushes my buttons and he doesn't pay his support. He doesn't show up on time and right. him, him, him. Right, and if I'm in that state or my ex-wife, if you're a dad, you know, either yeah. way, you know, if you're in a state where that other person is to blame for everything, then there's nothing you can do to make yourself happier. There's nothing you can do to fix that because you can't control your ex-spouse. Right. You can't control them. You can't control their behavior. The only thing you can control is how you choose to react to that. And, you know, there's something, there's a common saying that, you know, you can only feel as bad as you let somebody make you feel. Right. And and you make me feel bad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Maybe Tammy. you need to call Dr. Marmer. Maybe and see I do. Him I get some therapy around that. I'm telling you. <laughs> but you know, that's that's part of the whole taking responsibility. You know, and seeing yourself as responsible for your own life. Mm-hmm. Because the fantastic thing about being responsible for your own life and saying, okay, well, you know, like in my own case, okay. Do I have an ex-husband that didn't pay support and still owes me now, even though my youngest child is 27? Yes. Yes, I do. But you know what? I also chose to marry somebody like that. I -hmm. also chose not to go to college and to, I mean, I'm through college now, but at the time that I got married, I was 17. I didn't go to college. Instead of going to college, I married this boy, right? Right. So that was my choice, you know, and all of those choices accumulate and get you to wherever you are. And one of the things that he said in relation to this is he said, the more um, that you um, do this, the more that you're able to like take responsibility and, um, and, and for, for your own things in your own life, that it opens up right. more good options. More like, possibilities. Yeah, yeah. When you, when you choose the positive option, suddenly you're presented with multiple possibilities that are a better yeah. option. And then you choose out of that and then more possibilities that are a good option more. And it's sort of yeah. like it, it snowballs. It snowballs. It, it, it puts you on this trajectory of choosing positive things. And those positive things continue to accumulate and build a reservoir for you. Those positive events, positive interactions and positive decisions build a reservoir for you of positive feelings. Right. Like, you know, guys, uh, I, you, you always come to me when, when I represent you and you say, well, she's alienating the children from me. Right. Uh, so what's happening? Well, she talks negatively about me. She, uh, puts, puts, uh, you know, blames me for, for what's gone wrong in the relationship. She does this, she does that, she does this, she does that. Uh, and, it, and I just, I don't know what to do because nobody can see that she's doing this to me and the courts can't see it and nobody can see it. Somebody show me, you know, somebody show me how to get the court to see what she's doing to me. 
Okay. Right. That's a victim stance. Right. That's a that's a stance that says I'm not in control. That other people are controlling. And if they would just do, if she would just say nice things about me to the kids and and do this and that and 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 make sure and force them to see me and all this other stuff, then things would go away. And I'm telling you, that doesn't work. It makes yeah. everything worse. Yeah, you can't uh, you can't legislate, so to speak. It, it may not be quite the right word, but you can't legislate a child's love for a parent. In other words, you can't write down on a piece of paper, you know, the child will love this parent, you know, no matter what. It, by mm -hmm. the same token, one of the parents can't force. I can't say to one of my kids, you will love your dad. You will love your dad. You do love your dad. Love your dad. Go love your dad. Tell your dad you love him. Blah, blah, blah. That those things, even if I could coerce the children into doing those things, are not going to cultivate right. the feelings that go with that. Right. And plus, you're seeding the the uh, the causation to them. You, you're seeding. You're giving away your free will. That's right. that's what right. you're doing. You're giving away your free will because if but, you're a victim, then there's nothing you can do. Right. And the other you can't control her. And you view it as the other parent has the ability to make the child, make the children love me or not make the right. children love me. So I have this other guy uh, that, that I've been representing. He's got a domestic violence restraining order case uh, and he's got two teenage girls. And, you know, this, this guy's dynamite on wheels. He's found a place to live that, that has bedrooms. Uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's taking an active steps uh, to maintain and build his relationship with his daughters. Uh, and he's helping them decorate and he's helping them, right. uh, you know, fix en up the new Engaging them in the new place. Instead yeah. of, instead of, oh, mom got the marital residence and I can't do anything about that. Right. No. I mean, there's opportunity. Every, every negative thing like that has a flip side opportunity. Yeah. Like a mirror image. Yeah. And to that guy's yeah. credit, I will tell you what that conversation entailed. The very, uh, the guy called me at the very beginning of the case and he, this is the question he asked me. He said, Tammy, if I were your son mm -hmm. in this, and your son was in this situation, what would be the first thing you would tell him to do? Right. I said, first thing I'd tell you to do is to secure a residence that enables you to have the children overnight with you. Right. And, and he did it within like, a yeah, week, <laughs> you right. know, then like a like you said, he's dynamite on wheels. Within like a week, he had the residence. It was all set up. It was all ready to go. Right, and and that and I've seen cases in which, uh, which dad has has been so fixated on on blaming mom for for the situation that it cost him the case. Right, uh, because the case really, I mean, a, little kids is is a little different because little yeah. kids. You know, they're more dependent on you and they're more, you know, they're more forgiving in, in some ways. But when you when you get with teenagers, you have to take responsibility. Right. I mean, they are going to just, you know, they're going to use any excuse to say, screw you. Yeah, it's going to be no fun. Yeah. And so you have to make efforts. You have to relate to them like like they were other people. And, right. And be a person that's fun to be around. Right. Uh, and, you know, if you're blaming the other parent. It's not going to get that relationship. You have to make an effort. And you have to put in the time. And sometimes, sometimes the children are angry. Right. Because from their perspective, this relationship's broken up and their family has fallen apart. I think that my own son is very angry about this. Right. And it's been 15 years. Right. But he still has a lot of anger around the fact that, that he has to deal with step brothers and stepsisters and half sisters and yeah you know like you know his whole world and what i try to do is i try to give him a place that's home base right this is home base Tam tammy just did an aw awesome job on on their bedroom uh my two boys uh and they have like surfing and skating themes and it's colorful and it's fun and they're stick teenagers love stickers I don't know why there at least teenage boys do. <laughs> uh, and, and that has, I mean, there is nothing that my ex-wife could do that would destroy my relationship to those kids. Right. 
because, you know, I make an effort. We've invested. Yeah, we've taken family trips. We've done all kinds of stuff. And you don't, you know, it, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Right. Uh, it just, you know, that one person that I was talking about, the, the, the father that, that was blaming mom, if he had just gone to them with his hat in his hand and said, you know, I'm really sorry about what happened. Yeah. That would have been huge. Yeah. It would have been huge. Yeah. Or, or you know, even like I have, I sometimes have people that call that say, you know, the kid won't see me. I mean, moms and dads, you know, the kid won't see me. What do I do? I said, well, you know, it's your kid. If you, you know, most people, most of us, we know our kid pretty well. And so, like, I have one son that, I mean, food, eating. That's his, right, that's yeah. his love language. I All mean, teenage boys, food and, uh, and teenage girls. <laughs> yeah. But, but my son, it, you know, he, he played, he played, both my sons played basketball in high school, mm -hmm. but of course my one that, you know, eats more like, I mean, just, you know, the fuel that it took as a teenager to, mm -hmm. to fuel him and his basketball and everything, you know, he ate a lot. And so, you know, I used to tell my ex-husband this, like, just come down and pick him up and ask to take him to lunch. Like, whatever and he's like oh i always got to pay for something when i come well yeah okay. they that's that's part of having a teenager like i'm always paying for something for him too but you know do you want to build a relationship or not what's more important to you holding on to that money or having a relationship with your kid and it's not really your child doesn't really look at it as that kind of exchange like oh you know it's just that he would be willing to go if it was to get something to eat that's one of the ways that you could get him to agree to go with you yeah. you know and so really figuring out what that kid likes. I mean, we had a case of several months back where we had mom and, and dad was, was estranged from the kids. And one of the girls was a cheerleader. And so I asked mom at one point, well, does dad ever come to the games or see her cheer or anything? And she said, no, he's never been to any of it. Not a practice, not anything. And dad's reasoning was, well, the kid, they won't see, the girl won't see me. She won't, won't see me. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to go. And it's like, I wouldn't care if, if my son is playing, right. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be sitting on the bench every single time watching him play ball. Even if he never speaks to me from the time I walk into the time I leave, because I know that in the long run, that's going to matter to him. Right. He's going to remember. And my kids do remember my kids are 27 and 30 and they'll tell you, I, I never missed my younger son. I never missed a single game of his high school career. My older son, I missed one. I think one of them was a date night for me. That's because you. you don't like him as well. I, no, I think it was a date night for me and you. It was like I had just met you or something, and we went on a date. I th I'm so you sure. put your new I'm pretty sure boyfriend yeah. <laughs> above your kid. Yeah. Are I'm you pretty, ashamed of yourself? Yeah, I am now in retrospect. <laughs> at the time, you know, it was that was part. Of, it was that's all right. I used to go to the games too. So yeah, you did later on. Yeah, but that that our relationship was new and bringing me a lot of happiness at that point, and so. Right. You know, I think the big picture here is you got to focus on moving your life forward. Right. You can't both focus on moving your life forward in a positive way and focusing on your ex. Right. You, you can't do both. Right. If you focus on your ex, you're not going to move your life forward. Right. And if you move your life forward, you're not going to focus on your ex. Right. You know? Right. So, I mean, I, we could go on and on. I think we need a part two. <laughs> Probably. I want to yeah. leave you actually with just a handful of tips that he gave that, again, Thomas and I have talked about before, um, just to just kind of help you in those moments where you're mm -hmm. like just ready to, you know, react or fire off that nasty text message mm -hmm. or, um, you know, call him up and give him a piece of your mind, whatever it is. Here are some things you can do. OK, he said, stop and count to 10. I really like that one, especially on a text message, because people tend to fire off. I'm slow. I, I have to count to 20. All right. You count to 20. The rest of us will count to 10. <clears throat> um, you know, to to meditate on good things that have happened in your life, mm -hmm. to take a time out. You know, he suggested, you know, reading a Bible verse, or if you're not particularly religious, have a nice book of poetry. Or, or a mantra. Or, or, or a mantra or something. You know, whatever you know, you're into. <laughs> take, a, take a walk, get some exercise. You know, and then he said, you know, call a friend, you know, and he said in and in, in to me, that's kind of the call a friend is uh, is sort of a, a call your coach, you know, is kind of the other thing that that people do. Sometimes I, my clients have a crisis call, which is what I call it each month that they can use and they can call yeah. in that moment where they're like just feeling very. I reactive. married you, so I have unlimited crisis. calls. You do have unlimited crisis <laughs> calls, unfortunately <laughs> for me. 
but you know, and then he 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 likened it to like in AA. You know, you have a sponsor. They say call your sponsor when you're you know white knuckling it and instead of punching out your neighbor or or drinking (laughs) or you know whatever your thing is. Yeah, Yeah, that you're that you're acting out on. So. Uh, I thought those were really helpful tips. So uh, any closing remarks or does that wrap it up for you? Mm, I, that's it. Be, you know, focus on the positive, eliminate the negative. There you go. Uh, it, what is it? Something, the affirmative. I, I can't remember. I don't know. That's like a whole song, I think. Yes, it is. Yeah. We'll have to look up those lyrics. Okay. So we hope this has been helpful. We hope this helps you maintain your happiness and not allow your ex to steal it. You know, someday you'll look back, your kids will be grown, you'll be on the other side of this, um, you know, or if you don't have kids and you're just going through the divorce, it'll be a very distant memory. And you don't want to have wasted this this time in your life. You know, we're all only here for a short period, so you have to make the most of it. Right. Um, so we hope that's helpful. If you are watching us on YouTube, don't forget to hit like and subscribe to our channel so you get notified as new videos come out. If you are listening to the podcast, don't forget to rate and review us and also subscribe and you'll get notified each week as new episodes are released. And thanks for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Divorce University online podcast with your hosts, Thomas and Tammy Ferreira. For more information, visit www.divorceuniversityonline.com.